If it bleeds, we can kill it. Well, yeah, you can kill it if it bleeds neon green ooze that literally glows in the dark. I'd say that's a pretty easy monster to track down. Prey. So Prey is the newest installment in the Predator franchise, is directed by Dan Trachtenberg. It was released on Hulu, which means that I had no idea of what kind of quality this movie would be. Because after the first Predator movie, we've had some pretty good installments and also some less than good installments. And those are all theatrically released, so seeing a direct-to-video Predator installment didn't give me the biggest vote of confidence, but I can say that this movie it's actually really good and I'm shocked that it wasn't released into cinemas because 20th Century Fox, or I guess Disney now, needs a win in box office. A lot of their movies have been kind of underperforming and I think if this were released in theaters, it would have been the money maker that Disney's been waiting for. And that's because this movie is actually really good and it takes the franchise back to basics. It's a survival scenario in the middle of nowhere with minimal weapons and you have this thing hunting you and you can't even really see it and it's just picking people off. And while that might just sound like a lazy retread of the original Predator, this movie actually gives you a lot of fresh new original Predator ideas that feel at home with the original movie but are uniquely different in their own right. I guess I should start with the main character, Naru, played by Amber Midthunder, and she does a great job in the movie. She's a really talented actress, but I was a little hesitant going into this movie because I wasn't sure how well she was going to be written, because Disney lately has not had the best track record with female main characters, because a strange trend that I've noticed is that with main characters in Disney films, live action or animated, they like to make them perfect. They don't really have anything wrong within them that they need to overcome. A lot of the conflict in these movies comes from outside people putting them down and they just need to rise up above it, which is a story in its own right, but when that's the only story being told, it kind of gets old and you want to see them actually go through a proper hero's journey of learning something more about themselves and most importantly failing at obstacles so that they can learn and change their approach going forward and that is something that this movie does incredibly well with the character of Naru. She wants to be a hunter. That's her main drive in this movie. She wants to be a hunter. She wants to prove herself to the men of her tribe and even the other women of her tribe because that's what she puts a lot of value in. She sees people going out there risking their lives and she wants to do that too. An admirable trait. But the thing is, she's already an incredibly effective healer in the tribe, but she doesn't really see that as much more than just a side hobby or something that passes the time. But what this movie does so well is it shows that being a healer is not any less than being a hunter. She actually uses a lot of her healing techniques and skills in ultimately defeating the predator and in their confrontations. And it shows that her idea of what a hunter is isn't necessarily her. And you do see her fail in her early attempts at being a hunter. There's an encounter with a bobcat and there's an encounter with a bear where it's shot very intense and she doesn't win. She actually loses, but in that defeat, she learns something or picks up a different skill that she didn't have before. And now when she goes back and faces the next obstacle, she's a bit more prepared. And as I'm saying this, it seems so obvious that of course, this is just how you structure a story. This is how they should go. But it's remarkable for me, especially from Disney who historically has told really good coming-of-age stories, they skip that part where the character actually needs to fail in order to come back stronger. But to this movie's credit, it does it, and it was so nice to see a female protagonist go through this struggle, and the fact that she isn't the biggest and the strongest actually plays a role in the storytelling, because the Predator doesn't immediately see her as a threat, so she uses that to her advantage to sneak up on him and lay traps and just come at it from a different angle that isn't just squaring off and facing them with traditional weapons. And a really interesting part of Naru's journey that I haven't seen a lot of people comment on is the way the French trappers, you know, the white man that's come in to defile all of the nature, how that side plot actually informs how Naru 
approaches fighting the predator in the end of the movie. In the first half of the movie, she's trying to prove herself by coming at every obstacle like the warriors of her culture. But we quickly find out that that doesn't work for her. What she actually needs in order to overcome the predator is some of the trapping techniques laid out by the French. But that's not the only purpose that the French play in this movie because the predator is this invasive species you know it's this thing that doesn't belong and it's there and it's disrupting the natural order and there is a parallel to the french settlers when they came in and they disrupted the natural order because their ways of living were different than how the natives were so there is kind of a parallel there but even though there is a message there and i think it is a poignant one the french aren't just made out to be generic villains they do have other ways and techniques to help defeat the predator and while they're not the best people and they're not the most hospitable to the native americans they still provide some technology and tactics and horses that ultimately help in the eradication of this predator but now let's get into what i think most people wanted to see out of this movie aside from you know good character development and an arc and a hero's journey and you know all the things that make for really good stories but i'm talking about the blood. And let me tell you that the violence and the kills and the creativity on display is some of the best, if not the best, out of the entire Predator franchise. Because there are sometimes this movie where it just doesn't hold back and the Predator's just executing people, just chopping limbs and heads off in incredibly creative ways and, you know, doing the whole scorpion Mortal Kombat fatality. But it's not just the Predator that has some really creative visceral moments and yeah he does have the majority of them but probably my favorite moment is when naru is face to face with the predator and her neck's about to be chopped by this bladed shield thing and it's wedged between two rocks so it's just inching its way close and she reaches out to the predator's face rips off one of the mandibles and then uses it as a knife to jam back into his face it's awesome that is a top 10 predator moment in my book and it came from this movie and i'll never forget it because it was just so cool to see i've never seen anybody use the predator mandible as a weapon before so that was pretty awesome and i wish to see more of that in the future if they want to make more predator movies this is the way to do it. But as awesome as a lot of these more violent moments are and as satisfying as they are when they go down there were a few times when it looked like it was going to be an incredibly graphic rated R moment and I was ready for it but then it like cut away or cut to a shadowy version of it where you don't really see the kill. It's almost like they tried to edit it down to a PG-13 but then gave up halfway. So it's still R rated violence but it feels a little too clean at times compared to what I think they should have shown. And maybe that's a Hulu thing. Again, this is not a theatrically released rated R movie, so maybe a direct-to-streaming rated R movie. They didn't want it to be as violent as it could have if it was in theaters. But, you know, that's just another reason why this movie should have been in theaters. And if you want another reason, the cinematography is just beautiful. The production value, the lighting, the scope of it, where you just get these nice aerial shots of the Great Plains, just woods and lakes and streams as far as the eye can see, just really beautiful cinematography. But as beautiful as it looks, you still have that feeling of something's watching me from the trees. Now, it's not as claustrophobic feeling as the original Predator was, because that was deep brush jungles of South America. This is a bit more wide open spaces, but the Predator is cloaked for the majority of this movie, so even in the open spaces, you feel like you're vulnerable, like you just get picked off at any moment, you have no cover, and even if you ran out into a field, he could still catch up to you and be faster, and what do you know, that exact thing happens in this movie, and it's just as terrifying as it sounds. And on top of that, the references in this movie to other Predator installments, I think were handled really tastefully, even though the most egregious was probably when they said, if it bleeds, we can kill it, but in the context of things, it still fits. You know, it's not as forced as some of the Come With Me If You Wanna Lives from the latter Terminator movies. It hasn't gotten that bad yet. But the rest of them I thought were really creative. For instance, the Native Americans don't really understand thermal imaging, you know, that infrared vision that the Predator has. They do have this medicine that's life-saving from mortal injuries, but a side effect of it is that it makes you really cold, and when you're really cold, the Predator can't 
really see you as well. Now, it's not perfect. I don't think Naru really had time to explore that side of the Predator's weakness, is that when you're really cold, he can't see you. But nevertheless, it was still a nice little reference and nod to the original and one of the Predator's main weaknesses. But a lot of the references mostly come in through the different weapons that the Predator uses. He's got that net from Predator 2, he's got his big blade gauntlet from Predator 1, and don't forget the triple laser sight that was also in the original but has been in I think every Predator movie ever. But what's really cool about that that I haven't seen in I think any other Predator anything is that the sights can actually split off and separate because it's not a plasma cannon, it's darts, really big darts at that. Like these will kill you immediately. Big broad head just going right into your eye. That's still incredibly lethal even though, you know, it doesn't make as big a mess as your whole chest being blown out in the first Predator. And a reference that I didn't even realize was a reference until a bit later after I watched the movie was the pistol that she gets at the end of the movie that she takes from the French. That's the pistol from Predator 2 that the Predator gives Danny Glover when he's in the little spaceship at the end to show that Predators have been around for a long time and now we actually see where that came from and the first Predator to land was in this movie so it's a bit of continuity that I do appreciate that they took the time to tie together but at the same time it's not so distracting where if you've never seen Predator 2 you still see it as a trophy as a token of this incredible battle that Naru just went on and had her own little spirit journey of self-discovery and now she has both the pistol and the head of the Predator but my favorite reference is something that I'm not even entirely sure is a reference, but something that got my brain going about the original Predator that I really hope is a reference, because if it is, it's one of the most subtle and creative uses of this reference that I could have ever thought of. And it's when the Predator goes full Revenant and fights a bear, and he just picks up the bear and rips him apart with his bare hands. And you really see the Predator for the first time, even though he's still cloaked, he's just covered in blood from this bear and he's completely red and I really believe that this was a reference to the original Predator and the fact that the Predator when they were filming on location was a dude in a red suit because they couldn't chroma key out a green suit because they're in the middle of a jungle it's green everywhere so they used red because it's a great contrast against green so they had the Predator in a red suit and I just can't help but think when you see the Predator and he's just this big red monster that that's a reference to the original red suit that they used. So if you haven't guessed yet, I'm a pretty big fan of this installment. Because as much as I do find enjoyment in Predator 2 and Predators, neither one is really anywhere close to being as good as that original movie. But seeing Prey, I kind of see him as two sides of the same coin. You have a Marine with all this training, the best of the best going up against a Predator, which has its own flair of fun and stakes and drama that's unique to itself. But now we have this other story that's a Native American woman who isn't as physically imposing, that doesn't have as much technology, who's starting out at such a disadvantage that the Predator doesn't even see her as a threat, having to go up against this thing and defeat it. And that's a great story too that does borrow some elements from the original, but is a completely unique story for this scenario. And as far as execution goes, the original timeless action horror, suspense, sci-fi, classic, and I'd say Prey is just as good, if not better in some areas, than that original masterpiece. However, there is one thing that I don't think Prey executed as well as it could have, and it's a really minor nitpick, but it's the Predator's face when he doesn't have the helmet on. When he's got the helmet on, he looks awesome and it's mysterious, but when the helmet comes off and he's revealed, he just doesn't look as good as that original design. I don't know, there's something about the face. It just, it almost looked like they tried to make the original Predator mask, but then like grabbed it by the eye holes and just pulled it down, stretched it out longer and made it, I don't know, saggier. And I know it doesn't really change the overall movie or how I feel about it, but I just wish they went with a more traditional Predator design because I think they just got it so right with that original design that any way you change it is going to make it less imposing and threatening looking. But regardless, I still thought Prey was an incredible movie. It brought back the Predator franchise to its roots and gave us what we've really been wanting since the original movie is just another jungle wilderness survival story with interesting characters and stakes that aren't just retreads of the original but aren't 
I don't know, Predator Takes Manhattan. And while I had my worries about how they were going to execute Naru's character, I thought she was an incredible protagonist, very relatable, very sympathetic, and you really want to see her make it out of this situation alive. But now I turn it over to you guys. What did you think about Prey? Whatever you think, let me know in the comments, and if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content, and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. And as always, I'm Colby, this is My Dirty Talk, and I'll see you in the next video.